We will be in Exodus chapter 20. Open up the Bible app on your phone. Uh, We will also have the text on the screen behind me. Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 1. Then God, if you would stand with me this morning as we read God's word, just so excited to get into the message. I forgot to give honor where honor is due. Then God gave the people all of these instructions. I am the Lord your God who rescued you. I don't know what I was, I was thinking last night and putting my final prayer into this. He's the God who rescued me from all of my destruction. He's the God that rescued me from all of my bondage and bitterness and brokenness. He's the same God who rescued me from all of the bounds and the, and the, and the confines of sin. He's the God who rescued me from the destructive path that my selfish nature wanted to go on. I rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or of any image of anything in the heavens or on earth in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and the fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who obey my commands. Lord, today, Lord, I trust, Lord, that you are going to do a work in us, Lord, that we are open and willing to hear what words you have for us to say this morning. These are not my words, Lord, these are your words. Lord, I pray that you will speak through me, Lord, not to belittle or frustrate or confuse, but to illuminate and inspire our hearts to open up just a little bit more to your presence, your goodness, your faithfulness, and your works in our life. And it's in your holy son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can find your seats this morning. Thank you for standing in honor of God's word. Now, these are the first of the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses, right? I am the Lord, your God. Seems simple, right? I am the Lord, your God. The God who rescued you from Egypt. The God who rescued you from slavery. You must not have any other God but me. Don't make an idol of any kind or image or anything in the heavens or on earth or on the sea. And you may be thinking this morning, man, Pastor Alex, I'm not, I'm lost. Idols, gods, like I'm I'm lost, I'm confused. What is, what is, what is that? Where, where are they? Who are they? What do they look like? An idol is anything. Everybody say anything. anything. Anything that is more important to me than God. Look, I, I, if you know me at any level, I really love my wife. She is, although she's not technologically advanced. Uh, and uh, I, I, love, I love my kids. Like, my son's in the back serving today. You got another son sitting right here. And my daughter, I'm not sure. She, she's, in the, she's in the restroom. Yeah, there it is. This is the first Sunday, all three. Like, my, our youngest is now. Speaking of, I'm going to take a sidebar. We had uh, several students who've been in kids for several years who were with us in the adult service for the first time. Would you show some love for them? If you're one, welcome. Love that God has brought you to our church. And so I love my wife. I love Aiden. I love Easton. I love Bentley. I even most of the days love our dog, Steph. And uh, love my mom and dad, my in-laws. I love my family. Who's with me? You mean I love my, you love your family. And 
And uh, I love the Chiefs. You know, Coach Reed, Pat Mahomes, Super Bowls. Like, I mean, I love Arrowhead Stadium. I mean, I, I love the Chiefs. I love the Jayhawks. I mean, I'm, I bleed sometimes crimson and blue. I, I love, Co- you know, Coach Self, Coach Leipold, you know, national championships, bowl games. I mean, you know, uh, the mecca of college sports being Allen Fieldhouse. I mean, I love my family. I love the Chiefs. I love the Jayhawks. But I want you to hear me clear. None of them are even close to the way I love my Lord, my Savior, Jesus Christ. I love them, but they are not more important to me than God. And that's a hard thing to say. And this series, over these next few weeks, we're going to be unpacked these gods unmasked. And, and, and I have a little bit of an illustration. And for some of you, it's going to be just a little bit divisive. You know, when, when you see masks, and we still have several of these. Look, this one's not even open. I'll just rip it open. When we see these, if I can get it out. When we see these, I'll just throw this over here. Nate, you can have fun with that. No, I'm just kidding. I'll, I'll clean it up, I promise. When we see things like these, right, we're automatically divided. You know what I'm talking about? For some of you, you're like, man, those saved lives. For some of you, those were a waste of time. I'm not here to talk about that because that's not any level of the Lord for me because I have no idea if these save lives or not. I have no idea if they're a waste of space. I have no clue. But what I do know is that you have idols and you have things in your life that you're pursuing that are wearing masks just like this. They are concealing their true intent. They're concealing their true thoughts. They're concealing their true motives and are slowly destroying you without you even knowing it. Now, we may not be wearing these around like we used to, but I promise you there is something in your life, and I believe this with incredible conviction, there is something you're pursuing at this very moment that you believe is innocent, that you even believe is not destructive, and you're actually pursuing it maybe even with pure motives and a pure heart, and it's harmless, but if you were to really rip off the mask... For just a moment, you will find you're pursuing a thing or a person who is destroying you. Now, not long ago, we all found ourselves wearing some like these. You even had anchor ones that we made, you know, I mean, it was, and, uh, and we found ourselves wearing these in the grocery store, ball games, restaurants, church. I mean, we, you know, we find ourselves wearing masks like this and And I remember, maybe you can relate to this, okay? I remember the first time that I had a face-to-face conversation with somebody wearing a mask. It was hard. I had to ask them 10 times to repeat themselves. And I'm not, I'm not, again, I'm not here to, I'm not here to draw lines of division. I'm not, I'm just telling you my, my story. And I felt horrible that I had to tell, ask, hey, can you please say that again? Anybody, anybody with me? Like, you don't realize how much you read lips to interpret what somebody says? I mean, I find myself, like, it, it's, it's difficult, like, if having conversations in, in, in the dark, I'm like, uh, b- b- say that again? Like, I didn't realize how much I read people's lips. And so having a conversation with a mask on, both for me, and I have to anticipate for them, was a challenge. And it was like they were speaking a language I could no longer understand because a fixture in my ability to interpret what they were saying and to hear actually what they were saying was gone. Because I couldn't see their lips move. They're, they're like, so now I'm, they're speaking a language I can't interpret, speaking a language I couldn't translate. Now maybe some of you, you can, you can relate to that. That was a challenge. The thing is, is we have idols in our life that are the, happening, doing the exact same thing. And we've got to rip that mask off. Unmask the idols and the gods because right now they're speaking a language that you think is building you when it's, absolute, when it's actually manipulating you. They're speaking a language that is misguiding you, it is misinforming you, and it's misleading you. So an idol is anything that is more important to us than God. It's placing something or someone ahead of God. Y'all with me? Everybody in? It's time we take off their masks to reveal their true identity of what it is that we're pursuing. Because without removing that mask from that idol, we will never know their true intent. So Moses, 
at the command and guidance of God, right? Moses was, didn't feel like he was qualified. He, the Lord said, you need to go into, and, and rescue the Israelites from Egypt, from Pharaoh, right? You know, we've, we've all probably heard songs and done, seen many things about that if you've been around church. And Moses is like, I'm not qualified to do this. And, and he goes, and three months after they leave Egypt, the Lord directs Moses. They're like, hey, go hike up this mountain. Any hikers? You're like, man, I could hike up mountains. Yeah, we have a lot of hikers in there. Never done. So Moses climbs up Mount Sinai, and, and it was there the Lord spoke to him, and the Ten Commandments were birthed. Okay, Let's, I'm going to unpack these real quick. Love God more than anything else. Don't make anything else more important than God. Always say God's name with love and respect. With me? Honor the Lord and rest. Love and respect your mommy and your daddy. Never hurt anyone. Don't kill anybody. Just saying. Honor your husband. Honor your wife. Don't commit adultery. No greater form of honor than not cheating on your spouse. Right? I honor my wife by being faithful to her. My wife honors me by being faithful to me. And the Lord is saying, honor your spouse by being faithful. Don't cheat. Never steal. Be honest. Tell the truth. Be content with what you have and stop longing for others' possessions. Got awful quiet on that one. So I, I as I was journeying into this series of God's unmasked, I was curious in this passage... I wanted to find out from my own personal, why did God put himself first? Why is the very first one? I am the Lord your God. Don't put anybody else above me. Don't place anything of importance. Like, there's nothing more important than me in your life. And as I came to this one thing that kept resonating in my spirit, that God wants to be the ultimate thing. Like, this is the, this is the, that's the, the word that kept jumping off at me. God wants to be the ultimate thing. The most, the best, the greatest. There is no thing, there is no person, there is nothing greater in your life than God himself. So when we crave or we long for something or when we seek something or someone more than we seek after God, we are progressively crafting and constructing an idol and a God in our life that is starting to take the space at the ultimate level that only God can fill. A.B. Simpson, a preacher, a theologian, an author, and founder of a gospel ministry to immigrants in New York City in the late 1800s, says this, as long as you want anything, very much, I mean, think about that, as long as you want anything, very much, money, wealth, health, I mean, let's just walk down the list, as long as you want anything, very much. And he goes on to say, especially more than you want God, it is an idol. And we have to rip off those masks to reveal the true identity of the gods who are deliberately taking this space, that ultimate space in our life. The title for my message today is Idols Beneath the Surface. And so we can think of idols in this context. If I'm defining my self-worth, if I am drawing my sense of significance... If I am determining my sense of security from anything or anyone that is not the creator God, I am pursuing an idol and a God who is taking the ultimate place in my life. Because God, we see, he wants our attention. God wants our adoration, our allegiance. He wants our affection, our loyalty. He wants our devotion. Hear me. He wants your worship. He wants your worship. Now, what I know is God loves to give good gifts, right? Our, our worship team is awesome, and, but they're not awesome because they're talented. They're awesome because they're led of the Lord and they're anointed. God loves to give good gifts. You take a musician with the wrong motives and everything's going to be about them. You take a musician that just wants God to be glorified in their heart, and that's the kind of spirit you have in the room today. God loves to give good gifts. Talent, money, relationships, jobs, skills, these are all good gifts, but they become idols when they start to take the place of, God, of the giver. When the gift replaces the giver, 
We have created an idol that needs to be unmasked and destroyed. Matthew 7, 11 says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? God loves to give good gifts. He wants to bless you. He wants to show you favor, but he will not be replaced. He wants to be the ultimate. We create an idol when we turn good things and good gifts into the ultimate thing. God is not okay being lowered on your love list. God is not okay being lowered on your priority list. St. Augustine says this, idols are simply love disordered. Idols are just love out of order. We've taken the good gifts and we've replaced the ultimate gift. The foundation of every sinful behavior and every sinful decision is idolatry. I want you to think about it because I am pursuing fleshly desires. I am pursuing sinful behaviors. I'm choosing sinful decisions. It's because I've created idols that I've convinced myself there, that they, there is somebody or something that's taken the place of God himself. We worship our jobs. We worship ourselves. We worship our preferences. We worship our emotions and our feelings. We worship our selfishness. We worship our talent. We idolize what we worship. What are you worshiping today? We idolize what we worship. And when we worship something other than our creator God, it is taking up the space in our life that only the God of the universe is willing to take. And when we worship something or someone that is not God, we are sinning, and it's time that we, put, we dethrone those gods so that we can place our creator God, the one true God who came to heal us and save us and forgive us, the one who made us as we are, can take the ultimate throne in our life to place God at the top of the love list and leave him there. So over the next three weeks, we're going to unmask six different gods in our lives. And I'm going to tell you, it's going to feel a lot like heart surgery. But it's time for us to have some heart procedure. Because there are some things that if we're not careful, when we're tilling up that soil, trying to build culture in our lives and in our families, the truth is we got to break open that chest plate and let the Holy Spirit just do a little work inside. And we're going to reveal these, the identities of the things we're passionate about and determine, are these things that God has given me or are these idols and gods that are taking God's place? It's time we understand their true purpose. First one we have to unmask is the God of comfort. Now, many people are on this journey to, be, to feel comfortable. We want to look in the mirror and like what we see looking back at us. Fair? Many are on this journey just to feel like, I just want to feel comfortable in my own skin and our identity is completely surrounded by our desire to just feel better about myself. I want to just feel more comfortable with the way I look at myself. I want to feel more comfortable about the way I think about myself. I want to feel more comfortable about just everything about me. And so we make statements like, well, if I just had more money, or if I just had a bigger house, if I just changed my gender, if I just changed jobs, if I got a new social network, and we constantly are in this battle of an identity crisis of changing who God created us to be to hopefully feel more comfortable about ourselves. And we, if I could only find security in my future, if I could only find peace in my present, if I could only fix my past, and we, we start seeking comfort in ourselves. And so we put ourselves and the way we feel at the top of the love list, therefore regulating God down. So what do we do? We work endless hours. We spend endless hours at the gym. We jump diet to diet. We attend endless ther therapy sessions. We change our appearance. We confuse our identity, all in the name of comfort. I'm not comfortable in my identity, so I decide I would be more comfortable identifying as something that the Lord didn't create me to be. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, God created human beings in his own image. Say that with me, in his own image. 
Come on, we can do better than that. In his own image. In the image of God. He created them male and female. He created them. And so we aren't comfortable in our identity, so we determine God made a mistake about us. We create for ourselves an idol in ourselves, and now we're finding our self-worth, our significance, and our security in our identity change, not in the one who gave us our identity. We have replaced the ultimate for what we want the ultimate, hoping that we will just find some level of comfort on the other side of the fence. And I don't know about you, but every time I jump the fence trying to be more comfortable, I rarely find myself more comfortable. I usually find myself in more loneliness, in more desperation, in more discouragement, in more depression, because at the end of the day, crossing that line, even whatever that line looks like, crossing that line, that's not the line that God's asking you to cross. God is saying, I want you to stay faithful to who I created you to be. You don't need to transition to anything. Your identity is who, get what I said it was. I created you. I did not make a mistake. And so we... In our culture, we're being told, if you're not comfortable, just change your gender. That's what we're told. That's the attempt. If you're not comfortable, just change everything about you. And God's just saying, all I want you to do is take your eyes off of you for a moment and place your eyes on me because I need to be at the ultimate level and you're reducing me down. And God's saying, if you'll just fixate your eyes on me, you're not going to have to worry about feeling comfortable because you're going to find comfort in me. We don't need to change our identity. The creator God did not make a mistake when he created you. He was not confused. Hear me, he was not confused. Just because you're confused doesn't mean God was. God created you just as you are for this very moment. To be sitting in this room at this very time. Don't pursue the God of comfort. He created us male and female. Changing your identity won't lead to the comfort you hope will exist on the other side of the fence. And we're watching as slowly but surely the fabric and the foundation of people's lives are being destroyed in the name of comfort. I'm telling you, you can attend as many therapy sessions as you want. You could jump gym to gym, and I'm just as guilty of it as you are. At the end of the day, my identity doesn't change whether I run a mile or I sit on my couch and eat a Snickers bar. Praise the Lord. (laughs) Hear me in this. The God of comfort will destroy you because you're never going to be comfortable without God. He is the God of comfort. 2 Corinthians 1.3, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the merciful Father and the source of all comfort. And I, w- I want you to get this today. If Here's the enemy's weapon. If the enemy can confuse your identity, if he can confuse you about how God created you, then guess what he's done? He's actually confused you about the image of God in your life. Because it says, Genesis says, God created me in his image. And so if he can confuse and get me uncomfortable with my image, now I'm confused and uncomfortable with the image of God that I'm supposed to see. When I, when I look into the mirror, I'm supposed to see God looking back at me because I was created exactly how he designed me to be. And as long as I'm confused, I'm going to be confused about my image of him. And I'm constantly going to be on this journey to get comfortable about how I feel about God. And God say. I'm the one who gives you comfort. Stop seeking comfort in man's wisdom. Seek, wis- seek comfort in my wisdom. Trying to seek comfort from any other source besides God will lead to to destruction. Don't find comfort in your identity unless your identity is as a follower of Jesus. You see, me finding comfort in God will not bring more confusion. It'll actually bring my purpose to life. And too many people are willing to sacrifice their created identity to pursue a God where they hope comfort will exist. Only to be found most of the time more discouraged, more lonely, more depressed than they ever were before. I find comfort in myself when I find comfort in God. And we have to unmask that God and realize the enemy of my soul would rather me be confused by my identity than placing my identity right where God has called it to be. Because guess what happens? When we put God at the ultimate man, my life starts to find comfort and freedom that I never experienced before. Idols, misplaced love. So the question, seeking my comfort will place me at the top of my love list. 
will place me at the top as the ultimate thing. The second God we have to unmask is the God of confidence. The God of confidence. Now, I I want you to hear me. I am all about building confidence. Y'all with me? Like, y'all, I'm in. But the question that I have that I would like you to think about today is where is the source of your confidence? Who is giving or what is giving the strength behind the confidence that you are displaying? There are so many who lack confidence because of past trauma. Fair? Crisis, chaos in one season and they walk into another and it just, it's, it's, it's this proverbial downfall that just we keep walking into. Who's giving us strength behind our confidence? Is it the creator God or is it a self-created God? And so what ends up happening is we find ourselves in these seasons of trauma, which do exist. Seasons of crisis, they do exist. We find ourselves in these seasons because we're trying to find our confidence from something other than God. We never actually leave that season. And to this day, that season is still playing a huge role in why you are still living 10 years ago when you're living five years ago, 30 years ago. Because we tried to find confidence to move past that from something other than God himself. And that trauma and that crisis is going to continue to identify us, is going to continue to guide us and lead us when the truth is it's actually misleading, manipulating, and misguiding you because we base our confidence out of the season that God wants to heal us from. And then what happens to deal with the crisis, and I'm going to ask you to lean in for the next few moments really, really tight because you could easily hear something I'm not saying. And to deal with that crisis and to deal with that trauma and to deal with that season, our first go-to becomes a therapist. Their voice becomes the priority. Their thoughts become our focus. And so what we end up doing is our confidence now is no longer being built on God. Our confidence is now being built on the voice of that therapist. And the unfortunate reality for many of us, we have made an idol out of our therapist because their word is more important than God. We have determined that their voice weighs heavier in our life than God's. Therefore, we have placed our therapist and our therapy sessions higher on our love list than God. And we're finding our confidence in man And not in God. I want you to hear me. In the last five and a half years, I've had way too many conversations with, Pastor, this is what my therapist said. And not enough conversations, Pastor, this is what God said. Now, I know I just totally offended most of you. I'm with you. I'm in. I offended most of you. How dare you speak ill, Pastor, about my therapist? I couldn't live without them. Pastor, how dare you speak ill about my therapist? I would die if I didn't have them in my life. Pastor, how dare you speak ill about my therapist? I wouldn't have the will to go on if I didn't have my therapists. Exactly. You just preach my message for me. That is the exact definition of an idol we're creating that is taking up the space as the ultimate that the only one true God can feel. Now to alleviate you all thinking that this pastor is like sabotaging the entire mental health industry, I'm not doing that. A year ago at this time, I needed to go see a therapist. So don't think I'm sitting here speaking. I'm not having this tirade against the mental health industry because I believe in the need and the necessity of counseling and therapy because mental health, hear me, is a robber of confidence. It's a real issue, and it's a crisis that must be addressed. So last year, I found myself in a place that I need help, and I found it. But did I find it in a therapist? No. Did I find it in therapy? No. I found it in God. Because I found it in God with the help of a therapist who helped me remember who my source was. 
that when I was sitting in those sessions, it was not about what the therapist was telling me to do. It's about what God was instructing me to do. She, you see, that therapist had to remind me that I was, my confidence, and this is really what I was meeting, I was like, I was lacking the confidence to move forward because I was starting to go, well, if nobody shows up to church, that must mean I'm not a good pastor. My confidence was zapped. Well, if no, if, you name it. If we were lacking dream team volunteers, it was like, God, I don't... You mean, and so my relationship with God was being affected and I needed to be reminded who my source was. I didn't need to be reminded about another task list. I didn't need to be reminded about another, if you do A, B, C, D, F, and G, you'll find health. I needed to be reminded that the first thing I need to do in all situations is find God and not man. You see, my therapist took me to scripture first, not last, because God is our answer first, not our last result. Seek God first. And so if you are today seeing a therapist who's not faith-based and isn't pointing you to scripture, I'm going to encourage you to have a prayer session today about changing. Because if they're not pointing you to scripture, you're now not seeking God first through whatever crisis and trauma that God wants to heal you from. Because they, guess what? If you allow God to heal you from that, there's going to be somebody who walks into your life in a very short season that's going to be going through the exact same thing. And they need you to be Jesus with feet on. So if you're listening to or making decision and decisions and determining your actions from a counselor or a therapist who's not pointing you to God and his word first, then you possibly... So I'm not going to speak in definite as you possibly have created a God or an idol that is taking the ultimate place in your life. Because I wonder what would happen in your next session if you walked in and said, hey, this is what God said. <laughs> this is what God said. Because we don't, as Christians, we don't say that enough. This is what God said. Because here's the truth. If you walk in, well, this is what my pastor said. Don't you dare put me in a place in place of God. <laughs> I'm not your source of confidence. I may give you some excitement, and that's not me. It's the Lord speaking through me because I'm just a bonehead who the Lord just, I just chose to be obedient to the Lord. I'm not your source of confidence. It's God. This is what God said. Because if we want confidence to last, it's in God and in Him only. Isaiah chapter 40. Those who wait on God get fresh strength. Say that with me. Strength. They spread their wings, soar like eagles. They run and don't get tired. They walk and they don't lag behind. Our confidence comes from God, not any earthly thing or any person, because idols will not fulfill you. Idols will only break your heart. They will cost you more than you intend to pay. They will manipulate you into believing you're doing what is right and what is best. And then you start pursuing the comfort from man and they were, you're pursuing the confidence from man and eventually you're going to find yourself more lost than ever. More confused and lonely. You think you'll find passion. You think you'll find purpose. And what you find is more struggle, more conflict, more loneliness. Because the Creator God is the giver of both comfort and confidence. And seeking comfort and confidence in any source other than the ultimate God is creating and constructing a, an idol or a God that is taking the ultimate place in our life. And so we bow down to things like me. We bow down to our feelings. We bow down to our hurts. We bow down to our emotions. We bow down to our selfishness and our pride. We are bowing down to what we wish were truth. The only God I bow down to is the God who created me. The only God we bow down to is the God who created us, the giver of our confidence and our comfort, the hope and forgiveness, the God of reconciliation and restoration, the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That is the God we bow down to. And you may be asking, well, Pastor Alex, how do, how do I find this heart surgery? How do I find these gods I need to unmask? And I had a pastor friend share this a while back. He said, your idols and gods are generally found in the places of your greatest nightmare. What scares me the most 
if I had to live without? What scares me the most? Idol can be found in what you believe you can't live without. Saying right now, if I lost this, I'd just die. So if we idolize what we worship, then that means we worship what we seek pleasure in. So what do you worship? Who do you worship? Where are we seeking pleasure away from God? Because Moses comes down out of Mount Sinai. He has two stone tablets, if you will. And I imagine he's like this big old bodybuilder and he's like holding him victorious, like climbing down the mountain. By the way, I'm not a hiker, so I have no idea what it takes to climb up and down mountains. Brooke and I went to Canada and we were hiking. I was hiking in dudes, by the way. Don't do that. That's not fun. And so he's got these stone tablets and he's coming down out of the mountain and he's like, I got a word from the Lord. And if he were in today's society, you know what he'd be doing? He'd be like busting out his phone. He'd be like, I got to get on TikTok so that I can share this 60 second reel. I got a word from the Lord today. He comes down out of the mountain and he's walking towards the Israelite camp and he's excited. You know, he had to be excited. Like, man, I heard from the Lord. This is what God said. And he sees off in the distance that while he was up on the mountain, all the people who had just been rescued three months earlier from slavery had taken their possessions, had taken all their gold and some other items, and they put it together, and they built this golden calf. And they were dancing. Scripture says they were dancing, and they were celebrating around a golden calf. If you walked into some room and somebody was dancing around a golden calf, you'd probably be like... I'm going to about face and go the other direction. You know what I'm talking about? And he sees this. These are the people he just rescued from slavery. And now they're dancing and celebrating this golden calf. Scripture says he throws the tablets down, breaks them into a thousand pieces. He throws them down in anger. The Bible says he was so mad, he took the golden calf and burned it. And then he took what was left and ground it so hard it turned into powder. And then he did, that's, if that's not enough, he spread it over the water that they were drinking and made all the Israelites drink the powder of the golden calf they were just worshiping. And so my question to you today, what are you worshiping? Because there's a time in your life where you're going to need to get on your hands and your knees. And you're going to need to hold your hands. Because I wonder today if for just a moment, if Moses were coming out of the mountain and he was approaching your camp, he was approaching your house, what would he see you worship? What would he see you pursuing? Because we get on our hands and we get on our knees and we bow down to a lot of things in culture. What would he see? What golden calf would he see you worshiping? What idol would he see you pursuing if he were, were going to throw down, if he came down for a word, with a word from the Lord for you and he throws tablets down in anger? What would be the cause of that anger? What God would he find you pursuing? Because we're getting on our knees. But the only knee I'm getting down is for the ultimate God who's going to take the ultimate place, not worshiping anything, because any other God I worship will leave me empty and broken and bitter and angry and frustrated. Only the God of peace, only the God of comfort and the God of confidence as my source. Because what I know when we bow a knee and we start worshiping another God, you want to know what's going to happen? You're going to be left financially broke, relationally lonely frustrated, bitter, hurt, angry, emotionally exhausted and burned out. And all that's left is you're going to be sitting there on your knees one day going, where did it all go wrong? Today we need to pull that mask down because the healer is in the house. Hear me, the source of your comfort is in the house. The source of your confidence is in the house. Today, Jesus, we give you the ultimate place. Lord, we worship you and you alone. We're going to pull the mask down from these idols that are the enemy is strategically trying to deceive us and manipulate us. That God, we're going to give you the authority. We're going to give you the power, the honor, and the glory. Because God, we're no longer living for ourselves. We're no longer living for this world. God, you are the ultimate 
And we're going to give you the ultimate place in our life.